Charles was not above promising one thing to one group and the opposite to another. His goal was to continue to sow discord among his enemies. Charles ended up making an agreement with the Scots. The agreement entailed that they would help restore him to the throne in return to establish a national Presbyterian church as well as other terms that he had agreed to. The news of another national church alarmed the New Model Army, which was primarily made up of independents who just wanted to worship in peace without a national church of any kind, forcing them to worship according to the rules and the regulations of the land. Cromwell, reflecting on the sentiment of his men, went back to the House of Commons and called the king an obstinate man whose heart God had hardened. The king's supporters, now reinvigorated by the Scottish agreement, raised another army and commenced another civil war. General Fairfax ordered Cromwell to go into Wales and to crush a royalist uprising there. From there, he moved to the northern part of England to fight the invading Scots. He then went directly to Scotland and restored order. The last of the king's supporters was defeated at the Battle of Preston in August of 1648, and Charles was promptly arrested. Amazingly, Cromwell gave Charles yet another chance. He promised Charles to spare his life if he gave up the royal veto and abolished the episcopacy. Charles refused because he believed that he was the divinely ordained head of the church and state, and Cromwell seemingly had no desire for vengeance on his twice-defeated foe, but Charles was recalcitrant and simply unwilling to negotiate. He had proven himself to be a liar, a double-crosser, and arrogant. While Cromwell was in the north of England restoring order, in the south his son-in-law Ireton and the other officers brought a remonstrance to the parliament demanding the trial of Charles as a man of blood. Charles was found guilty of the crimes of tyranny, murder, and treason as a public enemy of the Commonwealth of England. Cromwell and 134 other people signed the king's death warrant on January 30th, 1649. King Charles Stuart was beheaded, and Charles simply said that this was a cruel necessity. After the death of Charles I, Cromwell soon discovered how difficult it would be to construct a new government upon the ruins of the old. Of course, the question that would reign supreme in the minds of the English people would be, what now? Now that the old order had been effectively toppled, and there had to be a new government or a new order to replace it, of course, much like the armpits of everyone, everybody has opinions and they all stink. Except for mine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, of course, this brought about a lot of movements and ideologies of where the nation should move to next. One of the most intellectually powerful movements of that day came from the camp of the Levelers. The Levelers were an independent Puritan sect that wanted complete religious freedom and annual parliaments, broader suffrage, property rights, and fewer taxes. They wanted the political leveling of the privileged position, or in other words, they wanted to strip nobles of their hierarchy. Their leader, expert pamphleteer, and spokesman was John Lilburn. John Lilburn served in the first civil war in the parliamentary army in 1642. But in 1645, after the Solemn League and Covenant was made with Scotland, which was a promise to reform the church along Presbyterian lines rather than Episcopal lines, well, this exchange was made for the Scots helping the Parliamentarian army against the Royalist army. This agreement was ultimately never kept by Oliver Cromwell nor by Charles II, but I am not going to get into that. Either way, at the time of the agreement, this led John Lilburn to be very disappointed in such a contract that he left the army and it led him to be a critic of the parliament and the army for not meeting the levelers' demands. As a result, he was in prison from 1645 to 1647. And in 1648, with the agreement of the people, which were a set of laws being proposed by the levelers, for example, the broader suffrage, the religious freedom, etc., which uh, ultimately ended up being rejected, this led to a leveler uprising. I will read this excerpt to give a little bit more clarity on the opinions of the levelers at this time. Quote, This settlement greatly disappointed the levelers, who felt abandoned by their leader. To them, the establishment of Presbyterianism was no victory. It was little more than a reaffirmation of Laud's government-run church, albeit a more austere version. We fought two civil wars to achieve this, was the leveler's cry. Cromwell put down an attempted mutiny by executing three levelers in his army. 
end quote. With the leveler threat now subdued, Cromwell felt he had no choice but to imprison John Lilburn in 1648. In 1649, Lilburn was tried for the crime of high treason, but again in 1649 he was acquitted and later was in prison and tried again in 1653, but once again was acquitted. John Lilburn was quite popular with the Londoners, and this led to a demonstration that alarmed the Cromwellian government. Lilburn was kept in prison until 1655 and was finally released, only to die two years later. Cromwell didn't hate the levelers or their ideas, but he thought that completely eliminating the state church was utopian and anarchistic, and it would actually lead to more unrest and perhaps even another civil war. He wanted to move England to a more democratic style of government, but felt that he needed to do so cautiously. He also had to put down an uprising in 1651, since Charles II had raised a formidable army of his own and invaded England in an effort to reclaim the throne for the House of Stuart. Cromwell defeated Charles II at the Battle of Worcestershire. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure we have some English people. Um, can you, you know, like, tell me if I'm pronouncing that right? Uh, I, I would greatly appreciate it, since I know that this is a very heated... Uh, debate as to the pronunciation of the stupid word. Not only was Cromwell dealing with the levelers and Charles at this time, but in 1653 he was also dealing with the growing rift between the Presbyterians and the Independents in the House of Commons. They were growing increasingly quarrelsome. The same year he dissolved the rump parliament stating that they were corrupt and unjust men, and then installed the so-called Assembly of Saints, or the Bare Bones Parliament, which he hoped would rule in the fear of God. The political unrest was becoming rampant throughout England, and the dispossessed royalists and the Anglican clergy were unhappy. Not only were they unhappy, the levelers were unhappy, the parliament was unhappy, but most importantly, the people were unhappy. In 1653, the Bare Bones Parliament met together, and it should be noted that this parliament was summoned, not elected. Another bizarre feature to this parliament was that some of the summoned members were to represent the constituents from Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. Either way, they felt that the Parliament needed to be representative of the nation as a whole, so they increased the number of representatives to, one, to 144. This included Cromwell as well. The Assembly made a series of votes, meaning that they viewed themselves as a legitimate Parliament. They chose Francis Rouse as Speaker of the Parliament, and Henry Scobell as the Clerk. This parliament worked long hours and strove to pass many reforms to their laws. Among the laws that were successfully passed were laws on marriage and debt. In the realm of marriage, they took marriage away from the oversight of the clergy and appointed civil registrars to record the weddings. In the realm of debt, they allowed special judges to adjudicate each case. The normal practice was for the debtor to be in prison. This was an attempt to introduce equity in the way that these cases were being handled. They also tried to introduce other bold measures such as abolishing the Court of Chancery and introducing a speedy legal code, but these never survived. Among all the issues that were dealt with, religion was the most hotly debated. The independents in the parliament wanted nothing to do with a state-run church or a national church, and the other side saw some merit in keeping the clergy under the standards imposed by the government. The other problem with getting rid of the state-run church was also getting rid of mandatory tithes and properties that were supporting the parliament. This sharply divided the members and led to the resignation of many of the moderates on December 12, 1653. This in turn led to Cromwell's closest political associates to write a constitution, the Instrument of Government, which led to the Cromwellian government to be established, albeit for a very short period of time. Cromwell could have easily turned into a king or even a dictator, but chose not to do it. Instead, he was given the title of Lord Protector. As Lord Protector, the executive power stayed with him, but he had no right to veto the Parliament bills, a power that he willingly relinquished. There are very few precious examples in history where someone has willingly given up their power. Under Cromwell, the Anglicans were allowed to practice rituals out of the Book of Common Prayer, as well as Congregationalists, Baptists, Independents, Levelers, Diggers, and other Protestant sects were also allowed to worship so long as they did not disrupt the peace. Under Cromwell, the Anglicans were allowed to practice rituals out of the Book of Common Prayer, as well as Congregationalists, Baptists, Independents, Levelers, Diggers, and other Protestant sects 
were also allowed to worship so long as they did not disrupt the peace. Across the Atlantic, news of Cromwell had spread to the colonies, and well, the reception was a bit mixed. On one hand, he did help the colonies from the encroachment of the Spanish and the French. However, on the other hand, he and his parliament were responsible for passing the notorious Navigation Acts. From 1649 to 1651, he had 40 warships that were built and dramatically increased England's commercial activity. Once again, I will refer to Ben Hart's book for some more insight to this era under Cromwell. Under Cromwell, the English began beating the Netherlands in trade and reduced Portugal and Brazil to political insignificance. France was seriously battered, and Cromwellian forces seized Jamaica from Spain. He did not want the world to fall to the Catholics, whom he saw not only as heretical, but totalitarian. To him, British colonization was an essential evangelical mission. His victories he saw as divine providence, declaring in 1654, as all the nations on this matter, and they will testify, and indeed the dispensations of the Lord have been as if he had said, England, thou art my firstborn. In August 1658, Oliver Cromwell fell deathly ill with malaria and a urinary infection. And on September 3, 1659, Oliver Cromwell passed away. It is thought that the death of his daughter one month prior helped hasten his death. Oliver appointed his son Richard as his successor, though Richard was nowhere near the caliber of his late father. Nine months after the death of his father, Richard renounced his position and ended the protectorate. Oliver Cromwell was laid to rest at Westminster Abbey, and his funeral was a grand affair. After the abandonment of Richard Cromwell, Charles II was invited back to London to restore his father's throne. Charles II ordered that Cromwell be disinterred from Westminster Abbey and that he be executed posthumously for regicide. Oliver Cromwell, his son-in-law Henry Ireton, and John Bradshaw, the president of the High Court, were all removed from their graves, hanged, beheaded, and their bodies thrown into common graves and their heads placed upon spikes above Westminster Hall. In 1658, it is reported that a storm knocked Oliver's head to the ground from the spike that it was placed upon, and it has been through multiple hands until he was finally laid to rest at Sydney Sussex College in 1960, though it is debated among historians whether that was really his body and his head or not. So, how did Oliver Cromwell affect America? Well, King Charles I was threatening to revoke the charters of the colonies and to place them under stricter rule directly under the English crown, but Cromwell and the revolution stopped that from happening and ultimately spared their American brethren from that fate. Cromwell also helped stop the advances of the French and the Spanish upon the young, fragile colonies of America, so I do believe that that is also merit for his indirect influence upon the states. Lastly. He, along with the revolution, shattered the divine right that was thought for kings to possess. No longer was the king viewed as an untouchable divine being, but that perception of that divine right was forever broken. It would make itself manifest in the glorious revolution that would take place in 1688, and would also be carried over to the fledgling colonies, which would soon experience a massive population boost from England. Just to give you some perspective, in 1630, New England alone numbered about 1,500, and then gained that massive boost through the next 50 years through both birth and immigration. By 1680, New England had jumped to 68,000 people in population, and this was largely due to more people flooding in from England. These new immigrants would carry with them the spirit that would be fostered for the next almost 100 years which would ultimately result in the brave American spirit to defy the crown and to fight for their independence from Britain. Now, this is not to say that there was no ire against the crown in the states before any of the immigrants had arrived after the advent of Oliver Cromwell, but what this would do is that this would further bolster that spirit that was already there in the states or in the young colonies, and it would continue to strengthen that movement, which would ultimately result in the American Revolution about a hundred years later. But you let me know what you think down in the comments below, and I will catch you guys in the next video. And don't you worry your pretty little heads, because I have part five of my ongoing series of why you should vote for Joe Biden. 
So without further ado, here is reason number five. A sort of a rash of videos that have been edited to make the president appear officially frail or mentally confused. Um, I, I'm wondering if the, the White House is especially worried about the fact that this, this appears to be a, uh, a, a pattern that we're seeing more of. Yeah, we, and I think you all have called this the cheap fakes video, and that's exactly what they are. They are cheap fakes video. Uh, they are done in bad faith, uh, and uh, and some of your news organization uh, have uh, have been very clear, have stressed that these right wing, uh, the right wing critics of the president have a credibility problem uh, because of the fact checkers have repeatedly caught them pushing misinformation, disinformation, uh, and so we see this, and this is something coming from from your your part of the world calling them cheap fakes and misinformation. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. The acolyte herself says that it, the, all these are just edited videos. They're fake. They're cheap. They're, they're totally biased edited videos to make the president look frail. Well, I have a few of these quote unquote edited videos. So you take a look for yourself and tell me if he is frail or not. And there you are, folks. The videos I have just showed you are just a drop in the bucket compared to what is actually out there on YouTube, Rumble, etc. But you let me know what you think. Anyway, I just want to let you know that the next video is going to be in three weeks. It's going to take a little bit of time to compile all of the information that uh, I'm going to be working with for this next video. So please just sit tight and wait. And I'll also be preoccupied. No, I'm just kidding. I won't. Uh, no, but I, I will see you all in three weeks. Thank you so much for your support, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.